Um, this is a meeting of the Board of Education in public for the purpose of conducting the school district's business and is not to be considered a public community meeting. There is no public participation in this work session. Would you please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, Mr. Chambers, roll call. Mr. Nichols. Here. Ms. Parkhurst. Here. Ms. Smoyer. Here. Mr. West. Here. Ms. Pritchard. Here. Thank you. Um, before I turn the meeting over to Mr. Um, Sable, because when we go to executive session, everyone bolts out as fast as they can, and I don't blame them. I just have like three things I would like to mention. The school musical starts this week. It's prom it goes Friday Saturday Sunday and then next week Friday Saturday the dedication of the two ball fields to be named Jim Wells sports complex will be this Saturday at 1 o'clock and I also would like to congratulate mr. Chambers and the, his department on receiving the highest achievement in open and transparent government for his financial statements so congratulations and thank you Okay, Mr. Zabel. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, it's nice to see an audience here as well. Uh, just to give you a little idea of our format tonight, uh, this is a work session, so it's gonna be a little bit of a different format, uh, how we typically operate uh, at our regular monthly meetings. Uh, I do want to welcome and thank our central office administrative team members for joining us here at the table. Um, we do have several things to go over tonight uh, relevant to the district finances, uh, personnel, uh, and uh, what we're looking in terms of making decisions for uh, the future of Medina City Schools. Um, so we do have a PowerPoint presentation to present to the board this evening uh, covering all of these topics. Uh, and we do encourage conversation uh, amongst the individuals here at the, I was gonna say round table, but I guess it's a square table. Um, as we move through the presentation, I do want to remind board members as well as the administrators uh, that are engaged here in the conversation uh, that it is not appropriate to discuss uh, specific positions or individuals in public session. Uh, we do have an executive session scheduled for this evening uh, where uh, we can have conversation uh, about those types uh, of items um, uh, where it would be appropriate at this time. Uh, we are, as we are looking at reductions following the guidelines and our negotiated agreements, uh, which has included an initial general notification uh, to our associations on April 1st uh, of potential reductions uh, and that is followed up with more specific information uh, regarding uh, actual positions um, at the end of the month, uh, I believe April uh, 30th. Uh, the board, uh, to my knowledge, would actually take action on those positions uh, in May uh, at either a special scheduled meeting or at the regular uh, scheduled meeting uh, if uh, those reductions are instituted. So Medina City Schools, what's next? Oh, do it. There we go, had to turn it on. So three things we're gonna go through in our presentation this evening. Uh, the first is to provide the board an update on our current status, uh, our, our financial situation. Uh, the second is to discuss uh, potential levy options uh, for down the road, um, whether we're looking at going back on the ballot in November or at another date, uh, it's essential that the district eventually goes back on the ballot um, uh, because we can't continue with a reduction in funding. 
Um, and then the, the third topic of discussion uh, for the work session uh, is additional uh, propo proposed reductions, which I had mentioned here at the beginning. So let's start off with the financial component, uh, and Mr. Chambers and I are going to go a little bit back and forth here. Uh, we had talked about uh, throughout much of the school year, uh, I think late fall, we had been identified by the state as being in precaution status. We continue to be in precaution status. As part of that precaution status, uh, we uh, needed to implement $2 million in cuts uh, that are going to be implemented during the 24-25 school year. Uh, these cuts or reductions uh, impact uh, all levels of personnel and programming uh, within the school district. Um, they amount to approximately eight to ten million dollars in permanent reductions. Uh, this is accumulative over the course of the next uh, four years. Um, so what the state is looking at is the two million dollars uh, that's implemented in reductions next year that they will continue into the following year and the following year after that uh, for the overall uh, amount uh, of reductions. Uh, the purpose uh, of these reductions was to get us uh, out of the red in year three of the five-year forecast. Uh, had we passed uh, a levy this past March, uh, that would have put us in a position with the additional funding uh, where with these reductions, uh, we would have been in a, a good, better financial situation moving forward. Um, unfortunately, uh, the levy did not pass. Uh, therefore, uh, we're in a position where we do need to look at and consider additional reductions. Uh, and again, this is due to the failure of the March levy. Um, the reason for these reductions is because it's essential uh, that we establish uh, financial stability uh, for the district and the district's uh, future. Uh, we have several unknowns uh, not coming up or coming up. Uh, for instance, when we're going to put a levy on the ballot, that's a decision that we need to make fairly soon. Uh, the amount of the levy we would put on the ballot uh, and then if the community would even support that levy. So those are very uncertain times that we have to prepare for. And in order to be responsible in preparing for those, it, 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 it requires us to make additional uh, reductions. Uh, at this time, uh, with what we're presenting to the board uh, this evening, uh, we are making an initial recommendation of an additional $2 million uh, in cuts for the 24-25 school year. Uh, and it's very important to note that these reductions are beyond the reductions that are already in the precaution report. So that would be a total of $4 million in reductions uh, heading into the 24-25 uh, uh, school year. Uh, we do have some flexibility uh, in some of the uh, work that we did and uh, reports that we presented to the associations to do reductions beyond the two million. Uh, but as we go through today and talk through things, those are dependent on some of the decisions uh, that are, are, are made uh, by administration and eventually uh, the board. So why are we here? Uh, and I, I think that's a very legitimate question uh, that we often hear. How did we get into the situation? Uh, and it's really quite simple. Uh, we've had uh, no uh, funding increases for uh, 11 years. Um, so no funding increases, no substantial funding increases for uh, 11 years. And uh, at the same time, uh, we've faced inflation, healthcare cost increases, pandemic, uh, higher operational costs. Uh, just like everybody has seen, whether it's running another business or running a household. Um, and we've done that while still uh, being proactive in advancing our academics and educational experiences uh, for our students uh, in the district. 
uh, and ensuring that we have top-notch educators uh, working within uh, the district as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Dave now. He's going to talk a little bit more about this. As you may know, the as Aaron said, we've had no new funding. Uh, we've basically been flatlined on our revenues itself over the last five years. Uh, but if we look at where we were in 2011, and I, I chose 2011 because that was right before the last levy, um, the state was paying nearly 40% of our revenues. Uh, that included tangible personal property reimbursement, that included uh, a uh, monies for homestead and rollback and that also included school foundation monies here in 2023 because that's our last full year that we have uh, monies collected the state's only paying 28.9 percent so uh, even though our revenues have basically remained the same uh, we could see the state's paying much less and the cost to our taxpayers is more and if you go to the next slide there craig Thank you. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that on our revenues and our uh, expenditures, I took the uh, amount of revenues that we were making back in 2011 and uh, increased them based on the uh, consumer price index. And if you look at the revenues, the jump that we have in the, um, the actual revenues, which are in blue, that was because of the levy in 2013 that passed. And we basically remained the same ever since. However, but if you look at what the consumer price index shows on where revenue should be, you could see the vast difference there. It's, r it's roughly $14 million difference. And then on the expenditure side, we are looking at basically the same thing. We're looking at where our actual monies or expenditure expenditures were at and comparing them to the consumer price index for the expenditures. And again, took 2011, because that was the last time before the levy passed, and then here last year. And you could see that we are actually underspending the consumer price index based on the amount of monies that should have been going. And I believe it's around two and a half million dollars under the CPI. And that's really important because it means that we, even though it's been said we've, we're overspending on everything that we do, we are not. We're, we're right there. We're actually below spending on what we should be doing. So, and that includes anything that we've brought in from uh, the um, reductions that took place before 2013, uh, all the programming that we've brought in, teaming at the middle school, uh, the, the, um, the new... Um, what is it, the new uh, programming that we've initiated throughout the years here for math, literature, uh, I want to call it ELA, um, and science and social studies over the years. So we are right where we should be below the consumer price index with our expenditures. Yeah, and, and I, th I think to really simplify this, if you look at the first chart, it's showing the amount of inflation that's occurred over the last 10 years and how our the funding re, we receive has not increased with inflation correct um, so our incoming money has not matched the amount that costs have gone up and in the second chart uh in, in dave correct me if i'm wrong it's showing that we've managed to stay below this with our spending and not overspend uh, despite this increase uh, in inflation. So these charts show a very conservative and responsible spending of uh, public and district dollars within the school district over the course of the last 10 years. I just want to make sure it's very understandable. Can I ask a question? Oh, that's what we're here for. So back one slide when you had the 2011, the difference between 2011 and 20, 
23 and the amount that we're getting from the state is about what six seven million dollars between then and now um, from the state we're actually getting less money and the reason for that is in 2011 we were getting tangible personal property tax reimbursement monies uh, we were also getting uh, monies for the uh, school foundation around 19 million dollars the tangible personal property tax was around seven million dollars at that time we're no longer receiving any tangible personal property tax um, and the uh, amount of money we're getting for school foundations around 17 million dollars so we're down about nine million if my math was right that looks like about ten and a half actually from the state we're get receiving ten and a half million less i'll leave it to the account thank you And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt here a little bit this evening. Our, our next slide is potential levy options, but I want to come back to this because I'd like to talk about the reductions first, uh, and then we can come back and talk about potential levy options because I think it, it would be helpful to go through that first to help us have the conversation about potential levy options. So additional proposed uh, reductions, uh, as, as I already mentioned, further budget cuts are needed beyond the initial precaution plan uh, and this is for I want to make clear going into next school year so we're not looking at waiting another year this is going into next school year um, and uh, again the two reasons why uh, we need to uh, slow down the deficit spending uh, and also secure our uncertain financial future um, so the initial two million reductions uh, initially were achieved mostly through attrition. Uh, attrition is through not replacing positions uh, that are naturally leaving the district. Most of those in our district tend to be retirements. Um, uh, I think it's important to point out, and uh, Mr. Shields, our uh, director of HR, mentioned this to me today uh, that just because we are not uh, we are reducing through attrition doesn't mean that it's not impacting the district and students uh, that still results in the potential for higher class sizes less course offerings uh, because those are positions that a year ago two years ago we very well may have replaced the positive piece to that, though, is it means we're not cutting, riffing an employee. Somebody's not directly losing their job. It doesn't mean it's not impacting students. With the additional $2 million in cuts beyond the precaution plan, we're in a position where we've already made $2 million in cuts through attrition that that additional $2 million has to come from somewhere else because we only have so many people that are retiring and leaving the district. That doesn't mean that we're not going to reassess every position as we get new retirements or somebody new who chooses to leave the district. We are definitely going to do that because we care about our employees. Um, but uh, we also have to be realistic uh, with the level that we're able to do that with the reductions that we've already made. So a re additional reductions uh, come through what's called a reduction in force or a RIF, um, uh, which will be using that terminology uh, throughout the rest of the meeting. And as we have further uh, reductions, <laughs> Uh, another way that those can come about are through the non-renewal or the non-filling of supplemental contracts. Uh, supplemental contracts uh, include things like coaching contracts, uh, contracts that individuals hold uh, for uh, clubs uh, and extracurricular activities. Uh, anything from, and I'm just throwing out random examples, chess club to marching band um, to, uh, I don't know, people sitting around the table could, National, National Honor. Honor Society, these are, these are all, all examples. 
Um, and then in addition to that, uh, we, we've also looked at budget cuts across buildings and departments. Um, so uh, e each year uh, we meet, Dave meets, his department meets with each of the building principals as well as the uh, district departments, the curriculum department, uh, the business department, people services. And we discuss budgets going into the next school year. Uh, those budgets are all going to be smaller uh, going to next year as well. So we've asked buildings as well as departments uh, to make budgetary cuts, which could be anything from paper and supply reductions um, uh, to uh, decrease in professional development, opportunities, field trips, things like that. Mr. Sable, um, back to those the supplemental contracts. Specifically, will we be targeting things that are not curriculum? Correct. We're, we're, we've got a slide where we're going to talk okay. about supplemental right. contracts. Okay. So I we're going to get the next thing we're going to do is go through various categories of uh, potential reductions and have conversations, general conversations, of what reductions could look like. Uh, within these various categories. And, and the first one is athletics. Uh, and possible reductions to consider within athletics uh, is uh, pay to participate fees and the caps. Um, we've, uh, over the years, we've reduced pay to participate fees and we've also implemented family caps. Um, uh, the other thing that we've had a discussion about are our ticket prices uh, for people to attend events, um, uh, coaching contracts. Uh, we can't reduce the amount that we pay individual coaches, uh, but we can reduce the amount of contracts that we distribute um, or the amount of sports that we offer. Uh, and then the other piece is facilities and facilities maintenance. Uh, so the upkeep of athletic facilities um, across the district. So after we went through and considered potential reductions uh, with the program area, we looked at, well, how does this impact students? How could it impact the district to help us go and uh, make decisions that are in the best interest of our students and fiscally responsible? I think what you were starting to allude to, uh, which uh, I think you're going to see as we go through each of these categories, these are not easy decisions because every single one of them has an impact on students. Um, uh, so trying to weed out the ones that are least impactful uh, is quite a challenge. So you, you decrease athletics, you increase fees, it's going to naturally uh, decrease opportunities for students. Uh, we've seen this in the past. I've seen this in other districts. As costs increase for participation, students tend not to participate in as many activities. Uh, it also causes challenges for uh, lower social economic families uh, that uh, can't afford uh, to participate uh, as easily. Uh, the other challenge uh, that we face with ticket prices is we uh, are in the uh, Greater Cleveland Conference and being a member of the Greater Cleveland Conference it is a partnership where we set league prices that are consistent across the league. Um, uh, so there is an expectation uh, that we will have consistent prices uh, as other schools do at least within the league. Um, there is the possibility that we could work with the league because of our financial situation to increase prices. However, I, I, I don't believe that the league would feel this would be acceptable for visiting schools and put us in a compromising position where we could be charging more money uh, for our own residents and parents than we would be for visitors coming to events. Um, Non-league games could be uh, an area for uh, conversation. Uh, another piece to consider is athlete safety. Uh, when you're looking at our facilities and facility upkeep um, or uh, you're looking at uh, the amount of coaching contracts that we're putting in place, 
uh, that are working with our students on the fields, uh, whether it's training purposes or whether it's oversight of the athletes. Um, quality and access uh, to, to our facilities. Um, uh, two things immediately come to my mind when we're looking at quality and access to facilities. Uh, the first one is our visitor stands, uh, which we had a bond issue on the ballot in November uh, for the visitor stands, uh, that they are reaching their lifespan. Uh, and if uh, they are reviewed and uh, seen as not fit for use, we would have to close those stands down. Uh, so we would be limited to use of the stands on the one side. Um, the other piece that comes to my mind is our track. Uh, our track is currently not uh, in, in great shape uh, and uh, needs replacement and repaving. Um, uh, that's something that we have had continued discussions about uh, that we've purposely been putting off uh, because of the levy situation. That's, a, that's another piece where if the track were unsafe, we wouldn't be able to use that. We would have to look at other options in terms of where our, our track program uh, would, would compete. And those are just two examples. Um, and then student mental health and, and school engagement. Uh, if you look at any of, of the research, especially for certain segments of our student population, uh, it's for some students, it's the engagement in athletics and extracurriculars. Uh, that actually keeps them engaged in coming to school uh, or uh, gives them a, a uh, and Chris, you could probably say it more eloquently than me, uh, but, but gives them a release from stress and anxiety and other things that they deal with as part of their everyday, whether it's school related uh, or not. So I, I want to open conversation in terms of athletics, if admin has anything to add or board members or discussion. I have a question. Um, you mentioned that the league sets up gate prices. I don't think that we do ticket or charge for every sport competition. Is that set by the league, which competitions can have a ticket price, or if, for, if there's things that we don't charge for that we could begin charging? Yeah, those are all league set. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the ability to charge spectator fees and things like that for some of the events. Um, but I, I know that's conversation on an annual basis, not necessarily the fees, but oversight of the events and rotation of what school oversees and hosts uh, some of the league events and, and things like that on a yearly basis. Another discussion that has come up is uh, the potential of making the athletic department self-sufficient. Um, uh, we do have, uh, I think our best example of a self-sufficient department in the school district is our food services. Um, and in order to do that, the, t the two ways that I can think to do that are through pay to participate fees, uh, as well as uh, through uh, the gate prices, the ticket fees. So they would need more income to support the program. Uh, currently within the uh, school district, uh, the district uh, picks up the cost of transportation and Chris, correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, as well as the coaching contracts, the supplemental contracts. So for the athletic department to be self-sufficient, they would have to take on the costs of the uh, supplemental contracts as well as the transportation. Yep, that's right. And I wanted to get back to your question, Becky. That's why I was texting an answer. Uh, we don't charge for baseball, softball, and track. And Aaron's exactly right. Some of it, not necessarily track. We don't charge for some cross country either, depending on the meet. It's the entry point. So if you can get people to one entry point, we do charge for playoff baseball sometimes. So some, I mean, there's a set price for it, but we don't charge for everything. Um, and, and yes, Aaron, you're right. So base, our athletic department self-supporting in terms of everything but coaches' costs and transportation. 
I think that's what you're asking. And I, I want to add to uh, as much as I'd like to say the food service department is totally self-sufficient. They do have state funding, which the athletic department doesn't would receive not any receive any state or federal yes. funding. We we could eliminate in um, coaches some of the coaches um, like. The assistant coaches, like basketball, has the head coach, and then the assistant coach, and then the JV coach, and the freshman coach. So uh, we could eliminate some of the assistants that would be down. That, that really would not affect safety of of the well, athletes. I, I it, it could affect safety. I think it would depend on the individual sports, and we would need to work with the athletic department. Uh, but w w when when I when we have up there the reduction of coaching contracts, that's what we're looking okay. at primarily. Uh, but it, it would depend sport to sport. Right. Okay. And that would not be in violation of the bargaining agreement. Not for supplemental contracts. So this is something that I had actually lived through as a uh, student when um, Buckeye had actually gone like full pay to play. Um, Coaching contracts were reduced. Um, I think year over year, the, the gate prices went up. I don't know if that was a league set thing. Um, but for anybody that doesn't know or doesn't remember, the step that the district had tried to do at that time was eliminate sports. And that would not be anything that I would even want to talk about. And I know we're not talking about it right now. Um, but I, I, I think I think the best option um, in the conversation that we're having right now is to start migrating some of that financial responsibility over to the programs themselves. Um, and I know that that isn't something that anybody wants to do because fundraising is the most fun thing in the world. That's why it has fun in the name. Um, but you know i i've been through it i lived through it um and you don't want to see programs disappear you don't want to see the athletics as a whole disappear because then students start leaving the district and that's that's even more money that gets taken away from the district um but i yeah i mean that's that's just my two cents on the the, the thoughts like sure let's we can have a conversation about moving some of that responsibility off of the district as a whole and to those programs. And in regards to the pay to play, you're talking about increasing it for the students the, or taking the cap away or? Uh, the p possibility of both. Uh, and we did pull some rough figures. Am I turn over to you Chris yeah. some rough figures of how much is funded through pay to participate currently mm -hmm. um, and some potential recommendations of where to go go ahead Chris yeah and I want to thank Todd and Mason who really helped and Brenda and transportation who helped with all this in the HR department so in some of the districts we talk to you're trying to look for maybe a 50 50 percent so meaning that with transportation and coaching contracts. That's what we're talking about. Because in our district, we're looking for pay to participate to cover the coaching contracts and transportation. Um, you're looking for the parents to pick up 50% and the district to pick up 50%. Right now, parents are picking up about 22.4% and the district's picking up about 77.6%. Um, so right now, um, coaching contracts are about one, this is middle school and high school. So coaching contracts, and transportation are about $1.63 million, and pay to participate brings in about $366,000. So I think uh, given that we would, our recommendation would be something about a 50-50 split. Um, because right now, like I said, we're looking at about a 22.4%. The parents are picking up with the amount they're paying in pay to participate in athletics, and the district is picking up about 77.6%. And again, that's transportation costs for athletics and coaching contracts for athletics. Thank you for that. That's good. So that would be, <clears throat> I'm just doing back in the napkin math, but we'd be looking at, I think the pay to play right now is 330. And if you're looking at picking up 50%, you're probably looking in 
seven hundred. We were we were ballparking at about where we where it was best was about where we were at when we were at six sixty with no caps. I remember that very well. So the, the next item we have is transportation. <coughs> Reduction considerations uh, to be made within the transportation department would be the elimination of high school busing, um, as well as the reduction to a two mile radius. Um, uh, it would be our recommendation uh, that if we did go to the two mile radius, uh, that if this was considered that it was potentially a permanent reduction. Um, one thing that I don't want to do is mislead the community or our parents uh, that were taking busing away to try and get a levy passed, especially with the current situation uh, and the driver shortage. Um, uh, there is a concern that if we are to cut busing and go to a two mile radius that we will lose uh, because uh, other districts are desperate for drivers. We will lose drivers and we won't be able to get them back. So there is a concern that if we were to pass a levy, the, the ability to bring busing back, even if we wanted to, could be quite a challenge. Um, and then the elimination of unsponsored and funded field trips. Um, and the reason why I say unsponsor, unsponsored and funded is because we do have many field trips that are funded through grants uh, or uh, through parents uh, paying a fee to go on the field trip. Uh, and I wouldn't want to eliminate those opportunities for, for our students. So student impact, uh, obviously if you're reducing field trips, it's a reduce, reduction in educational experiences. Uh, if you have students walking a further distance, uh, you're talking about student safety. Um, uh, it's especially a, a concern uh, with the redistricting that we're doing next year uh, and students going to new buildings uh, down at the uh, elementary uh, buildings. Um, and then staffing concerns, which I had already mentioned uh, w with our, our bus drivers in and losing those drivers and not getting them back in the future. Uh, and then always a concern if we're not transporting students is the impact on student attendance, uh, which student attendance uh, has been a challenge for districts across the country since the pandemic. Um, so to exasperate uh, that issue uh, could be a real concern. So if you don't have busing, if we're taking away busing, are we taking away drivers, buses, gas? Is that what we're? The reduction is in personnel costs through drivers. Uh, it's in reduced amount of buses, which we lease our buses. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in a reduction in fuel costs. Um. <laughs> Um, having grown up in the country, um, I'm really opposed to cutting busing. Um, and this is just one example. If uh, you and I happen to be related and you're going to Claggett and I'm going to the high school and we're outside the two mile limit, why can't I get on the bus? I can walk from Claggett. I mean, I think it doesn't make sense. You have brothers and sisters that are going in the same direction, why they can't get on the bus. Plus, the more butts we can put on the bus, the more money we get from the state, right? And also, well, I'll just keep going here. Um, we have kids that are gonna cross major highways. I mean, the, the kids, I, last time I talked to the transportation department, the kids over coming from Heritage, <clears throat> they're gonna have to go to Fenn we're going to cross three major highways. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want. I mean, we saw what happened on the square. I don't want that to happen again. And that's very easy. If you've ever been down there um, where Guilford dead ends in Route 18, and somebody's late for work, they don't even stop. They don't care what the color light is. In fact, the other day, somebody decided they were going to make a new law and turn left on red because there was no traffic coming. I don't. 
I don't want to see that. And I also don't want to lose any bus drivers. I mean, because no matter what, we are going to need bus drivers. And uh, to eliminate them, I just think, and it also puts the parents who need busing the most, the people who have to work maybe two jobs, that is what we we need to help them out. I mean, this I'm, this is, and it kind of seems like a punishment. But I am uh, the busing. I don't want to see a kid like I did before the levy passed the last time, walking down Route Three in the rain, soaking wet, because we did not have busing for high school kids. Five hundred kids are affected by eliminating high school busing. R currently, I've I've asked that question. Outside the two mile limit. If we would keep, if we just would do two miles for everybody, that would knock off 200. But I just am, the transportation to me is we have to get kids here to school in order for them to learn. And they won't come. I mean, and the other thing is, if my, both my parents have to be at work at 7 o'clock, they're going to dump me off at a, a, a building at 6.30 in the morning. What am I going to do until my school opens? Here at the high school, it's okay. It's like, you know, roam around until school starts. But for elementary kids, you can't get in the doors. I don't want to see drive by a school and see a little kid sitting out there because we c their parents have to work. So that's my two cents. Actually, it was more, but. Yeah, and yeah, our, our administrative recommendation at this time is to not do a reduction in busing uh, because of really two main reasons the first one is the safety concern uh, and the second one has to do with uh, the amount of financial savings that it offers cut reducing cutting busing does give a financial savings but doing the cost benefit to how it impacts our students I'm gonna let Ryan talk a little bit more with state funding and how that fluctuates it's like a scale depending on how many riders you have yeah it does it uh we do you were right gene we do get uh compensated per, per student that we transport um it does not cover the cost of transporting transporting students we we all know that but there but there is a cost savings and like aaron said the only way we save money is eliminating buses if we get rid of the the bus that's the only way we save money. Otherwise, we still have them running routes. Um, all the high school buses run elementary routes. So eliminating high school busing, we still are, have those same drivers driving routes. We just reduce the amount of time that they're able to work, which then might make them look for other jobs. So we, are, we, we get uh, $1,160 per student um, for transportation purposes. Um, we currently actually support 2,740 students that, that are riders. If we eliminate it and go to two miles, um, no high school busing, we're down to 977 students. So we would receive a lot less funding from the state. So just to clarify, because I know this is the state minimum, what the consideration is. We currently provide more than what the state minimum is. Does the state provide funding based on that state minimum? Or do you see what I mean? Are we yeah, getting? No, it's, it's based on riders. So we do still receive funding for the high school students. Um, at least I think we do, Dave. Yeah, you we receive funding for the high school students. It's based on riders and based on mileage. So uh, the state gives a portion of the funding for each. But we do not, by state requirements, we do not have to transport high school students. Correct. And there are districts who do not transport high school students. Ryan, can you clarify how much that is total, though? I don't want, we don't get like $1,160 per day per student. I just don't want oh, people no, no, to no, think no, that we're was per, getting. Yeah, that was per year. Sell? I'm sorry. So our, our actual money that we receive from the state this year for uh, transportation is one million one hundred ninety nine thousand dollars eight hundred and thirty two dollars thirty cents which might sound like a lot but can you talk about it's about a, a little over a third of what we pay to transport students that was my question 
So we roughly spend about three million dollars. That is correct. To transport. Thank you. And that uh, that is all of the costs. So that has in there sports, field trips, everything. Um, we just we base it on the cost to operate the vehicles for that for a year. So if it takes sports and band and anyone else that uses uh, like encore choir that probably and if they had to become self-funding for transportation that's probably takes out a million dollars wouldn't you guess no, no uh chris you had those it's a numbers little over two hundred thousand. that's for athletics alone and music oh and music okay mm -hmm. that no because how <laughs> you said that it was 1.7 for sports and 1.2 for co for just the co-curricular. So if you subtract that, you get 500 at least 500,000 in athletics. So it's 1.632 total for coaching contracts and transportation. Yeah, and Dave says that co the co-curricular contracts are 1.2. So it's more than he gave you the 9 through 12 coaching contracts. That's 1.2. The middle school coaching contracts are another 166,000. Okay, but let's let's go, still go back to the the uh, amount of money that is spent in on the co-curricular transportation. That still is going to be close to half a million dollars, at least 400,000. For athletic co-curricular transportation Brenda gave me these this morning it's a hundred and eighty three two ninety seven twenty six for nine through twelve and thirty five thousand six hundred and thirty one oh one through seven through eight that was last year's transportation costs for athletics okay she she told me it was more she told me it was closer to five hundred thousand I wonder if she included music and other things that might have been okay I, I just like to say I know um, where I live, um, both of my boys, when they were in the high school, took advantage of busing for quite a long time, you know, just even though, uh, one, because they didn't have a license for quite some time, and I, they very much looked forward to riding the bus, and especially when they were younger, they loved getting on the bus in the morning, and I think that's an important piece to remember. Kids like to ride the bus. They want to ride the bus and show up to school. Um, and I, I, I just think that's important. And I see it. I, I know when I drive, to, I, I drive to work in the morning and I pass route. And I can't imagine the, the number of cars now increasing by probably a factor of two uh, without buses dropping kids off. And that's just at route. And route's actually fairly easy to get into compared to some of our other schools so I just wanted to add that I hear mr. West and Ms. Pritchard um, and again none of these decisions are easy and I know we're just having conversation here um, but like with the busing I mean we already have a large population of our students who don't even have the opportunity to ride the bus because they live within the one mile radius um, that was that was me and my family um, and I think there's also a lot of families who drive their kids that could be riding the bus or walking. They already drive their kids. I believe Canavan is a walkable building. There's no busing at Canavan, but there's a line of cars out there all the time. Um, so just putting that out there, that we do have a large community that already does walk. So. I'm sorry, I think you said earlier we, we have riders of what, 2,700 and change? Yes, 2,740. Then we have about, what, 6,200 students, so it's 45% of our students are riding a bus every day. So 55% are not, so. Do you know how many people are eligible, <coughs> excuse me, eligible to ride the bus but elect not to ride the bus? Uh, 4882 are eligible at all of our buildings to ride the bus. And that includes the 27? Okay, so. No, 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 no. So how, how many are eligible is the 4882. The right. number of riders that we provide services to is 2740. So we have to do, the state requires us to do a um, student in a seat count. Mm -hmm. 
Right. We do it a couple of different times. That was our count this year was 2740. But we have 4882 that are eligible inside or outside of the one mile of the buildings, but still students in the district. Okay. Does that include the 2700? So that it's an additional 2100 that are not riding the bus? Correct. It, out of the 4,882 eligible students, only 2,700 are writing. Okay. Correct. Which is about 55 percent. Just checking your math. Yeah, 2,142 <laughs> students are choosing not to ride the bus. Right. And I, th I think you see a lot of that reduction in ridership at the high school because those eligible riders go all the way up through 12th grade and once they turn 16 and can drive many of our students drive that is correct yeah. like not to yeah. ride <clears throat> so the the next item we have in terms of reductions is facilities and maintenance uh, so reduction considerations uh, is uh, annual uh, projects um, every year uh, we have regular maintenance projects that occur across the district uh, and Ryan can touch on these in more depth uh, but uh, the the big three that you see going on annually especially over the summer uh, are the paving roofing and landscaping projects uh, the paving and roofing projects are especially big um, and important uh, these are projects uh, that if we don't keep up on uh, then uh, you, you get in a hole and you have to spend a lot of money to catch back up with in order to keep the roofs uh, and lots uh, in, in shape um, one of the discussions we did have is looking at our rotations and expanding those rotations um, and, and I'm just randomly throwing this out, but if we had like a five to 10 year rotation on something, extending that to a 15 to 20 year rotation, obviously if you did that with something like a facility, you're putting more wear and tear. Uh, it's not gonna be in as good a shape towards the end of its life. Um, and then just facilities and grounds uh, in general. It is important to note that uh, the bulk of our facilities and maintenance uh, is funded through the sales tax uh, uh, for our permanent improvement projects. Um, so that does put us in a positive position in regards to uh, being able to continue on with many of these projects. However, it's important that people are aware uh, that a big chunk of that money that we do receive uh, is going and will continue to go through 2037 uh, to pay for the building of Northrop and Waite Elementary School, uh, which was a decision and an initiative that was made to save taxpayers money uh, rather than going on and asking for uh, an additional bond. However, that does take money away from the facilities, grounds, and regular uh, maintenance uh, that occurs uh, across uh, the district um, and then if if we aren't on a regular schedule for facilities and grounds and having to make decisions uh, obviously stakeholder safety uh, is something to consider another conversation that's come up is uh, the recreation center um, and we are in a joint operating agreement uh, with the city uh, which is a collaborative agreement. Um, so if we were to consider any adjustments in regards to the recreation center, uh, that is something we would need to collaborate on uh, with the city. Um, and I think it's important to note too, uh, you talk about our school district and how we serve kids. Uh, the recreation center I think is an outstanding example of how our school district uh, works to serve the entire community um, and through that collaborative relationship uh, w with with the city uh, the performing arts center uh, is another uh, piece uh, that we've talked about uh, we have a beautiful performing arts center uh, it, it is uh, a facility uh, that does come at a cost uh, but uh, the potential of limiting 
Uh, the amount of school use and performances that occur uh, in the PAC and shifting those to some of the smaller facilities, uh, whether middle schools keep performances within uh, their uh, gym gym gymatoriums, did I say that right? Um, or whether there's increased use of the middle auditorium uh, at the high school. Uh, which are less expensive facilities to operate and potentially use the performing arts center as more of a money generating outside use facility uh, which I, I wasn't here when that was put together but uh, I, th I think that performing arts center uh, is a gem uh, for our programs but i think it's important it's something we need to talk about ryan anything you want to add in terms of i know this is your department so yeah, no, I think you covered uh, you covered that well. Um, we had talked about performing arts. If if we ran that as a as a business, what that would look like, and uh, it's not what it was designed for. It was designed for our students, and I think we need to keep that in mind when we look at that at that facility in particular. Um, we are quite fortunate to have the sales tax um, with more of these. Uh, larger shopping opportunities coming to Medina with the Myers coming in and shopping of the South. As much money as we can keep in Medina County, the better off we are. I know Dave and I have talked about this before. Uh, when I first came to Medina, our sales tax has, in the just the five, six years I've been here, the sales tax has increased quite substantially. So it's been nice that we've been able to complete bigger projects and complete more summer projects using only sales tax money so um, we are quite fortunate uh, to have that we need to to recognize that eat local what percentage I, of the sales tax do we collect it's based on the population of each school district right. it's based on student population um, we get together on a yearly basis to go through uh, what the state has for student population and adjust for any students that are leaving the district and or being uh, open enrolled into districts and after we all come to a conclusion we submit it to the county auditors uh, I'm, I'm sorry the county itself and um, we basically give the recommendation for the percentage uh, this year, uh, the uh, Medina schools are getting roughly 24% of the sales tax. So, Amy, the other thing that goes along with this is I uh, this year was the first year I did it based on the, my new role, but I have to submit all the projects that we're going to complete using the sales tax money so that uh, the Medina County gets to see what we're using the sales tax dollars for as well. Is the just clarification facilities and grounds that is excluding athletic facilities and grounds? No, that is inclusive In, of those. Okay, I wasn't sure because we did talk about with the athletics the away stand, so I just was trying to yeah no, figure out where that separation was. That is the same. Okay, and that's that's one of the things that Aaron was talking about. You know, we we try hard to take care of our facilities. And maintain them to the highest level and a, a perfect example of that is the the turf we budget to replace that every 10 years but we're going to try to get 12. yeah no that makes sense and one more question in order to maintain what we're doing now about how many pizza places mattress shops and car shops do you think <laughs> we need to build more i think we the i think we're maxed out on on pizza mattress and oil change a uh, Trader Joe's would be something that would be very beneficial to this community. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that uh, statistical analysis. Uh, if I may, the, the second bullet point below, the sales tax for the North Ripon Way, when we passed the sales tax, I don't even remember when it was, that was part of it, that we were going to use that for that if i remember right to pay for i'm sorry to, to pay, pay for, for northrop and way yeah we do yeah so that's, that's not is, is not something you can't do you just no. you have to do it and that comes up right off the top that's the first right. thing that dave pays for with the, with the sales tax money and then we look at our projects and our five-year capital plan yeah well i i, I think it's 
I was amazed uh, when I got on the board just the number, the amount of roofing that we have to replace every year just to maintain what we have. I think you gave some figure like 580,000 square feet of roof or some ridiculous number. We have, in this high school facility, there's 500,000 square feet under Okay, roof. so that was this building, but that's not the other buildings that we have, that's too. That's correct, yeah. That probably right, that right there is the single most important thing that we can do just to keep our buildings. Yeah, that's, uh, it, it's very important to maintain the, the structures. Um, Paving is another one, though, that is is equally sure. important. It's it's hard on not only school vehicles but our our visitors. So we like to maintain and keep the facilities to their best ability. And I want to remind the board that back when the levy failed back before 2013, um, we made concerted efforts to not fix anything unless we absolutely had to because we were trying to save money. Uh, since the levy passed in 13, and Ryan the Department, you've got a 10, 15 year plan of projects that are prioritized. Um, so that, this is just paving, roofing, and landscaping. That doesn't include all the other things that we have to repair and maintain on a regular basis. And I think we saw back when that levy failed, uh, things were in disrepair. And it did cost us more to then fix things. People might recall, I think there were some leaks in the high school and some of our other buildings. And the paving, if you do it regularly, it costs less money. But if you just wait until you have to replace it all, then it costs more. And that's just something to be very cognizant of. And at the same time, you always have to be prepared in case you have a sudden major expense, like a f furnace system goes out at the high school. Uh, the elevator. Yeah, here. the elevator. And that, you can't not repair it. You have to repair it. Or the um, hot, water. hot water heater. Hot your, water heater. Your 1,400-gallon thing. Yeah, we had a couple doozies. Uh, that was just uh, last year. Elevator and hot water tank at the high school alone. Mr. Chambers, how much um, do we currently pay every year for Northrop and White? It's around 1.5 million um, for the two of them. And uh, we receive, right now we're receiving roughly $4 million uh, from the sales tax. And the next item for discussion is academics. Uh, th this one is uh, particularly difficult. Um, all of these categories that we're talking about impact academics in some form or another. Um, so when you talk about uh, reduction directly with academics, uh, these are really large impactful uh, reductions to uh, students, staffing, uh, and programming. Um, after all, academics is the, the core reason why we exist as a public school system. Uh, so running through these, uh, the, f the first is supplemental contracts. Um, again, we've been talking about supplemental contracts throughout the evening. Uh, we offer all kinds of supplemental contracts, athletics, extracurriculars. We have supplemental contracts uh, within academics and academic department as well uh, through academic supports. Uh, so those are contracts that we could uh, review and consider. Uh, the other thing is curricular adoptions, um, whether it's uh, changing the cycle lengthening the cycle between curricular adoptions, similar to what I mentioned with some of the maintenance, uh, or uh, r reducing those adoptions. Obviously, those have a direct impact on our students. Uh, if we're bringing in uh, less uh, curricular uh, materials or a lesser quality of curricular uh, materials, uh, that's also a challenge uh, because oftentimes uh, the state doesn't give us a choice. Uh, like when uh, they decided just this past year that all districts in Ohio needed to implement new language arts curriculum for next school year. 
Uh, we were actually very fortunate as a district that we happened to be right in our natural cycle of doing language arts, but I know many of my colleagues in other districts that weren't. Um, so I had to come up uh, with the money for that. Uh, reducing professional development for staff, that would be all staff, uh, whether it's in-house professional development um, or, or providing opportunities outside the district. Um, uh, the other thing is stipends and grants. Uh, we do offer teacher grants uh, throughout the course of the year. Uh, a, a good example is our deeper learning grants, uh, uh, the, the work uh, that, that we showed on our, uh, remind me of what it was called, the Port Portrait to Practice Expo. Many of those teachers uh, that participated in that had received grants at some point. Uh, to assist them in their work uh, within the classroom and, and the curriculum. Um, uh, we've also historically have offered stipends in the past uh, to uh, help uh, with extra work on curricular initiatives. Uh, looking at uh, tuition-free all-day kindergarten uh, as well, uh, we implemented that approximately eight years ago. Um, uh, I, I would recommend to the board that that's something that we look at as a last resort. Uh, the, the research shows the importance of early year education. Uh, I, I think we're eventually, I don't know if it'll happen by the end of my career, but I do believe eventually it's going to be a state requirement uh, that preschool is offered publicly to everybody. Uh, so it'd be a major step backward. Uh, going to a half-day kindergarten or a tuition-based kindergarten. Uh, kindergarten uh, is very different than it used to be 20 years ago. And Mr. Uh, Sable, I don't know if you mind me. Sure, go I ahead. Jump in for Mrs. Casty and myself. For someone who used to teach preschool, I think we've had some people in the public, you guys probably have too, come up to you and people feel like kindergarten is a lot like, if we have all day, that it's a lot like daycare. But I, I would ask people to think about when our kindergarten was a half day, it gave our teachers about two and a half hours to teach things. And so by the time kids got settled and into a routine, maybe you're down to an hour and 45 minutes if you're lucky. Uh, and when you're required to teach a full curriculum and expectations and have students pass tests, uh, as you are in kindergarten, an hour and 45 minutes, let's say, will give you two and a half hours, just isn't enough time. So I agree with Mr. Sable wholeheartedly. I think preschool is going to become a mandate at some point, as it should. Um, but I think we need the, the public to start to understand that all day kindergarten is kind of a minimum standard for kids. And it's and I'd encourage anyone, I know Mrs. Pritchard and I have talked to come in, see what we do, um, because kindergarten isn't playtime it might be play-based learning but it's really not uh, it's a whole lot of learning and a lot of education that helps build the foundation for the future so I think it's a really important thing I'm gonna, that we do. I'm gonna jump in there too um, yeah I mean we went for the curriculum uh, committee and saw kindergarten second grade fourth grade and I went and saw kindergarten well I have a kid in preschool so kind of know what to expect but i feel like if you are not actively in it right now in this day and age you very much have that oh it's just you know daycare if that's what they're doing in daycare let me know where because that sounds like a fantastic daycare like there's kids talking about like i think one of the things was mucus and like they knew exactly what mucus was and congestion and uh, what was that? And congestion. And congestion. Yeah. I don't know a kid that could be like, I'm congested, give me Sudafed. Like, n no. Like, we, <laughs> there, there's a lot more going on there than mom and dad need you to go someplace while we work. And just, sorry, backing that up. Well, and I know Mrs. Cassie presented when we were talking about this at the board, has it been five years now, um, provided data of our half-day students and their test res results versus those in full day to support that. Yeah, we do have that data to support our, our students projection and learning later into elementary uh, who were in half day and full day because at one point it was a choice. We had tuition based and some other things. So yeah, we see the academic growth and the academic difference in students. And the next item on here is middle school teaming. I think this is another area where uh, 
there's some misunderstanding with what it is just because so many of our families haven't had the chance to experience it uh, because we just brought this back uh, three or four years ago. Uh, but middle school teaming allows for uh, transition years for students between the elementary programming uh, before they enter into the high school programming. Um, so it, it's an important time for them to uh, experience higher level coursework and options, but still be able to work in smaller groups with teams of teachers uh, that can directly uh, meet uh, their individual needs. I do think teaming at the middle schools is an important model to our students. However, teaming is a very uh, expensive model uh, because the amount of personnel that it requires in order to develop the teams to meet the students' needs. And uh, we didn't directly put this on here, but I'm gonna bring this up. Uh, one thing uh, that I would ask the board to consider um, uh, for the near future uh, is if we are in a position where we're looking at additional reductions uh, and ways to do that, a potential way to uh, save some programming like teaming is to proceed with the five, six, seven, eight model yellow plan uh, that we did not proceed with uh, because of our facilities and look for a way to make that happen. Uh, because it could potentially allow us to continue with some of this middle school programming and still make reductions because we would be consolidating our grade levels, similar to what's happened uh, at the elementaries with the redistricting uh, going into next year. If we were to do that, I mean, obviously in November we didn't pass a bond which was to replace Claggett. If we were to proceed with a 5-6 building at Root and a 7-8 at Claggett, that would mean adding basically trailers at both facilities to do that. Yeah, we, we would have to rework the numbers, which we have not done. Uh, n next, next year would definitely not be an option. Uh, one thing that we are cognizant of, though, is we do have smaller class sizes coming up from the elementaries. Um, so we would need to rework the numbers of what those class sizes would look like in our current facilities. Uh, I would anticipate that we would need some level uh, of trailers like what we currently have at Claggett, uh, at Root, uh, and possibly at Claggett as well. Yeah, and one thing. Um so AI Root had trailers at one point in time. And I actually remember that. And uh, all of the uh, equipment there to, to put them back in place would, would be available to us. So that's one thing that we have talked about moving uh, with the 5, 6, 17. So that's the infrastructure for electrical and all of that's still there. Yes. Just dormant. Dormant. Mm -hmm. Good way to put it, dormant. Well, we were hoping we would never have to go back to trailers, but. Well, and, and again, we don't want to do that. We're, we're trying to explore avenues to keep academics and programming in place as much as possible for our students. And just as I talked about um, tuition free all day kindergarten, <coughs> middle school teaming provides a lot of mental health support at a time when kids need it the most. I mean, kids need it a lot of different times, but. Uh, middle school is a very challenging time, and, and mental health support at, at middle school is an important time. And teaming allows us to work in a closer setting with kids than going to a big building and having a bunch of different teachers all day. It allows for the teachers to work with the same kids all day and then meet as groups of teachers to talk about the same kids. So you have the same sets of eyes on students all day, so you can talk about them and really get to see what's going on with them. So it's an important thing. Did, did I also understand with the teaming that they're getting... Uh, more time with like English language arts and math which is right. you know core curriculum that everybody needs so they're getting what double periods double or block English so arts and math. if we didn't have teaming they would just get a normal 
45 minute period instead of 90 minutes or whatever that time frame is correct so it's increased academics but also you know smaller sets of eyes on kids when they need it most All right, thank you this is uh the teaming is definitely one of the things with talking to a bunch of kids throughout um the middle schools and kids that are excited to go in or kids that have already experienced it that's one of the things that you know i'm glad that we're throwing it out there that we're having conversations about how to keep it but in a little bit of a different view than it is currently because this is the thing that i'd be you guys would be dragging me out here kicking and screaming if you know everybody's like all right it's ready to, it's time to cut it and it just it just seems like the kids that are coming in that are going to hit the ground running in any sort of format you don't notice if if teaming's helping them or not but the kids that would actually come into these um new and different and challenging environments in new and different and challenging moments in their life um that's that's where you really see teaming kind of take off and kind of help the students and like help them not really skip a beat too much um i know somebody said it's about trying to make sure nobody falls through the cracks there's no 100 percent option to that but if you can get real close to it you know that's that's better than just throwing your hands up and saying oh well right so the the next item on here is gifted services uh, we're fortunate to offer gifted services uh, across the grade levels uh, gifted services are not mandated uh, by the state uh, so that's something we potentially could reduce uh, special education uh, special education reductions are not very easy because there's so many state and federal mandates in terms of providing student services in special education. Uh, however, uh, we could look at the level of services that we're providing. Uh, we provide a high level uh, of special education services uh, to our, our students. Um, uh, we do receive quite a bit of uh, state and federal funding, not enough, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that we're looking at uh, every corner of the district as we're working through these lists. Um, and the same for mental health supports as well. We've worked very hard even prior to the pandemic. Uh, this is actually uh, something I'm very proud of of our district. Uh, a lot of credit goes to uh, Chris and Mina and their work uh, in this area, uh, but just ensuring we have mental health services uh, in place district-wide uh, to meet uh, the needs of our students, not only at a district level, uh, but also at individual building levels, but looking at that programming and potential reductions uh, to uh, those services. Um, and then uh, technology as well uh, across the district. Uh, we are one-to-one. -one. Um, I don't think there's any way we can move away from one-to-one. -one. Um, it's an expectation and it's what our students are going to be experiencing uh, when, when they leave um, Medina City Schools. Um, uh, however, looking at the way we structure that programming or where that programming begins, um, our conversations that we can have. Uh, another thing that I wanted to make sure I noted here in looking at the technology we have in the district, uh, whether it's a, it's a video board, touch board panel uh, like we have up here, uh, which we've been fortunate to be able to put many of these in our classrooms or whether it's the Chromebooks that we've been able to put in our, all of our students' hands, those have been almost entirely funded through ESSER funds, which are funds that were given to us by the federal government because of the pandemic, because we were able to use those dollars to uh, support uh, students with technology and technology uh, driven items. Um, so that, that's where those purchases came from, not out of our general fund. Another example of where we use those funds, the air conditioning in some of our buildings where we didn't have it. Uh, that was another area where we were able to use those. 
Um, and then district impact, uh, obviously reducing student programming. Um, much of these reductions uh, could say could be permanent. Um, uh, and I say could because when these kind of reductions were made last time, it took a good 10 years to bring much of the stuff back. Um, so you don't know what will or what may not come back. Uh, it's much quicker to make it go than it is to bring it back. And obviously that impacts student learning and student mental health. I got a question real quick on the um, tuition free kindergarten, going back to that. What does a paid tuition kindergarten like per year per student look like? I'm going to defer to Chris. I'd have to go back and look up what so we charged. Ago. But when you're going to do that, you also then have to offer a half day option for yeah. the parents who can't afford the tuition based or yeah. choose to have the half day. Um, so it, I. I, I'll look it up while you're talking what we yeah, used to charge. I can find it. but um, Yeah, it impacts transportation, too, because you have to run midday routes for the right. kindergarten programs. So I for could, sure. Yeah, I can look all that up for yeah, you. Just, back just curious what the number looked like there. Yeah, I'll Thanks. look at it. And then the next item uh, is extra and co-curriculars. So these are... Uh, all the supplemental contracts. Uh, so I'm going to hit upon uh, some of the ones that we didn't get into as much here. Uh, but if you're looking at our arts programs, uh, we offer supplemental contracts across our arts programs, uh, uh, whether it's plays, concerts, theater productions. Um, uh, also program and extracurricular offerings K through 12, and we did mention some of this, but student organizations and clubs, um, as uh, well as staff supplemental contracts uh, for extra duties. And most of these staff supplemental contracts or extra duties have to do with student supervision. Um, so that would impact uh, the oversight of students and the district impact, student enrichment opportunities, student safety, and again, the mental health and school engagement. And then the last item here, and we're not going to be able to get into as much detail with this in public session tonight, and we'll talk more in executive session, but uh, is the very difficult conversation about personnel. Um, as I had mentioned at the beginning, uh, reduction in force, uh, otherwise known as a RIF for a PK through 12, uh, and this would be impactful uh, on administrators, teachers, and support staff. Impact on the district, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you that we are going to see all of these next year, even without the additional reductions, with the reductions we're already making. So the question isn't, is there going to be an impact? The question is, how big of an impact is there going to be? Uh, but it results in larger class sizes, fewer course offerings when you're talking about the high school and the middle schools, uh, student mental health. Um, and, and this was an interesting piece and in conversation we had uh, as a group as well, but the impact on the local economy, which I think sometimes we don't think about um, but uh, Medina City Schools is actually one of the largest employers in the county, uh, and we are the second largest employer in the city next to uh, the hospital. Um, so when you s start talking about people losing jobs within the school district, uh, that has a direct impact on our local economy uh, when people are out of employment or are forced to move from the community because they no longer have a job here or need to look for a job elsewhere, uh, and uh, then that's a snowball effect uh, that impacts property values. Uh. On the property values, I, um, just this is just a comment. I think uh, you had told us, Mr. Chambers, um, that since 2021 through today, our property values in Medina have increased like, what, 23% or something like that? And I, 
it was some amount like that. I don't remember the exact number, but my point is that's in no small part to the fact that we have a good, strong school system because people want to move here because we are Medina, because we have all of these things here. It's why my wife and I moved here 24 years ago and we raised our boys here, so it's, it's just a, an observation. I found the 23rd, July 2013 letter that Mrs. Casty and I sent to parents. It was $800 um, due three times a year, so $2,400 a year. And then if you had redu if you were on reduced lunch, it was $600 due three times a year. So you're checking my math, uh, $1,800. And then for if you were on free lunch, it was free. And then I was starting to think, as you were saying that, if we went back to that, then we had to have different classrooms so we also had to make sure we had enough students so we didn't guarantee you would have um, pay tuition kindergarten in your building unless we had enough people otherwise you had to go to a different building um, and then we also needed different teachers right so we would need full day teachers and half day teachers at each building so all of it was up in the air until uh, Jim Shields and I got back the numbers and we could decide who had enough to hold full day in their building and who had half day so it was a uh, logistical. HR logistical nightmare a little bit because you had to make sure you had enough to pay for or fund a teacher of enough kids to be in a full day classroom it also resulted in some kind sometimes different class sizes in a full day and a half day so I was just thinking about all that as well so what I'm going to do now is go backwards uh, in the slide deck to levy options. <clears throat> so I think some discussion and direction of where we want to go in terms of a future levy drives all the decisions and the reductions on all these other slides that I shared with you. Mr. Sable, before you do that, sure. um, I just wanted to mention it's upsetting. I know this is hard. Um, I've been on the board eight and a half years and hired you. And we did our first strategic plan. And we met with the community. And a lot of these things that we're seeing on here are things that the community came to us and told us they wanted. They wanted smaller class sizes. They wanted gifted services, more guidance counselors. They wanted all day kindergarten. And it is heartbreaking to me now to look that we have to cut these things because our community has changed and now has said that these things are not important. And maybe that's not directly what they're saying, but by voting down the levy, essentially we are forced to make these changes. So I, I did just want to make that clear. I, I've got the most seniority on this board, and I just wanted to make sure I pointed that out to the board and to the community members. It is great to see community members here tonight, maybe a dozen, 15, and this is the most community members we've had at a meeting in a very long time probably at least two years um, but it's also in a district of 6,000 it's surprising we don't have more here because this impacts all of our parents and all of our community members <sighs> thank you uh, I'll, I'll just add to um, mrs. Parker's comment um, my boys were coming up through uh, the schools right around the time the last time we had cuts and uh, I, I've told a story where one of my boys needed a little help and he couldn't get it because there was no resources at the time now today he would have gotten that help and so I've seen what it is and you know um, we came here because in no small part because of Medina City Schools so it's yeah, it's heartbreaking to have to even discuss this, but that's the reality, so. Mr. Stable mentioned it took almost 10 years to get these things in place, and we're essentially moving backwards. And it will take a long time to get whatever we, to replace these things. So I know we're not making a decision tonight, we're, we're talking about these things, but I think it is important to maintain whatever student programs we can we have as much as possible um, because we are here to educate our students and I think pro programming has to be the priority to to keep 
potential levy options uh, <coughs> and it, if that if that is the philosophy that we're moving forward with um, I, I think it's uh, the team's recommendation uh, to go back on the ballot in November and we'll talk through all of these options and why we have that recommendation uh, but we do have an opportunity in November 2024 to go back on the ballot uh, if we were to do that and we were to pass a levy uh, we would not lose another year of funding uh, like we did the last election because it's still within the calendar year we still have to make that additional amount of reductions um, but we wouldn't have the massive reductions on top of it if it were to pass however there are challenges with november uh, the first is that it's a presidential election uh, which could impact uh, the success of the levy um, uh, historically and statistically it's not that schools don't pass levies during presidential elections but it can pose more challenges uh, simply because it's much more difficult to be on people's radar uh, because there's much other big issues uh, on the agenda uh, the other concern is voter fatigue it would be our third time in a row uh, on the ballot uh, that we'd be going back to our community and asking for money and funding um, I think a, a positive glass half full way to look at this though is that we gained quite a bit of progress and support uh, from the November election to the March election uh, just according to uh, the elect by the election results um, so that could be a sign or a message from uh, our community um, and again I already said uh, reductions would still be necessary if we don't go on in 2024 November uh, definitely strong recommendation we need to go on in 25 um, we are definitely going to have to make major reductions and the full set of reductions uh, uh, that we're going to discuss throughout this evening into next year if we wait till 2025 um, because we have the guaranteed loss of at least uh, one year of additional collection um, so it would require significant uh, budgetary cuts uh, the other decision to be made uh, is the levy type uh, we have gone to the community for a continuous levy uh, which i will always feel uh, passionately about um, i think continuous levies i don't think i know <laughs> continuous levies are what creates stability for a school district and students uh, and when you talk about accountability i'll say it over and over again hold your board members accountable hold your superintendent accountable don't hold our students accountable um, uh, if it's frustration over state funding which i do know is many people's frustration um, uh, we, we definitely have other avenues to address that uh, rather than things that are going to impact the classroom uh, the other option is an emergency levy uh, with an emergency levy uh, you can do an up to 10 year emergency levy if we go the emergency levy route uh, it would be my recommendation uh, to do at least an eight year uh, to the maximum of a 10 year and the reason why is because we know uh, that uh, with the 7-5 uh, that we had just put on that we would still need uh, to go back to taxpayers uh, in another four or five years and the last thing you want to do is go back with a renewal uh, and an additional levy at the same time um, that's asking an awful lot uh, from the community um, and then the last big question is the levy amount um, and uh, this is something I really thought long and hard about uh, and again if you talk about maintaining current programming uh, with the 7.5 mills uh, that we had requested uh, during the last election uh, we requested that that was already a reduced amount of what we actually needed 
uh, and already needed uh, eight to ten million dollars in cuts uh, in order to proceed uh, with that amount. Um, uh, if we do anything lower, it's going to be a reduction in programming and, and further cuts. So at this time, I want to open it up to discussion and conversation. Did, did we ever get any information on uh, income tax? Okay. If, are we continuing to pursue that? Okay. Thank you. Can you elaborate on that, please? What, what do you mean income tax? Ms. Pritchard asked me to call the Department of Taxation to see what type of an income tax would support the school district um, if we were looking at roughly the same dollar figure that uh, we were looking for with the f um, funding from the 7.5 mills. So I uh, called them and they did not return my call. I then wrote to them um, and they have not returned my email as of yet. So we're still pursuing that. Um, Mr. Chambers, about uh, the precautionary status. So that was three years out. So I believe it was the 27, 28, where they considered us in precautionary status that we had to do the big report about, correct? They were looking at 25, 26. Oh, 25, 26. Okay, thank you. So in May, when you do your next five-year financial forecast, there's pro we're probably going to have at least two years of precautionary status then? Well, with the reductions that we have to make uh, based on the precautionary status, um, those will be implemented. Uh, that will get us through 26 at this point. Uh, what will happen in May, though, is they'll be looking again out to 26, 27, and 28 and determining where we are. They'll definitely have an eye out for us in November of 20 of this year with the five-year forecast based. Okay, so they only look at in November? Is it November forecast? No, they'll be looking to make sure that we're doing uh, the reductions here this year. Got it. Okay, thank you. But in November, we could potentially have an additional yes. year of precautionary November, status because we're if, going a year if, out. Correct. They'll be looking at it again. Yes. So a couple thoughts that I have. Um, Yeah, yeah, just decompressing. I get it. A uh, <laughs> um, couple thoughts that I have is um, a, you know, I, w I, I wouldn't be opposed to looking at an emergency um, going on the ballot in November. Um, I think it having talking about having some additional cuts here um, with the conversations that will be coming up um, and not going on November. Um, kind of does a little bit of a disservice to the community and the voters of kind of giving a little bit of the aura of, well, we'll just cut things and then try again next year and not give the community a chance. I understand a lot of people put a lot of work into November. A lot of people put a lot of work into March to try and make it happen. Uh, these levies are not simple things. You don't just file a petition to get it on the ballot and then call it a day and hopefully it works out and it doesn't. Um, but, you know, just for me looking at it, I, you, you got to put it on the ballot. Um, we, we can't just not. Because um, ultimately, if it passes, great. If it fails, you're essentially doing the delay until 2025 initiative anyways um and then looking at the emergency levy the length i don't know off the top of my head definitely an eight to ten would be where my mindset um goes but i think we have to project out some um future ballot initiatives that we'd have so five years, if we needed um, additional money with the way inflation and everything is going and stuff is getting more expensive, we probably would, right? Um, conversations about, okay, do we maybe look in between that period to try and do the bond again? Because um, facilities are only getting worse. They're not getting better. We're putting a Band-Aid 
on, you know, a gunshot, right? Um, and just having conversations where those type of, of, of ballot initiatives might lie. Um, and I'll do a two-second soapbox because I've heard this from a couple people, the voter fatigue thing. We have been on the ballot twice, right? November and March, we've been on the ballot. And voters are already fatigued of, of having to deal with it, having to hear about it, having to go to the ballot box. Y you know, I, you'll have people that will stand here and preach about the American flag and the freedoms that we have and every uh, people that fought for the right for democracy, right? Um, and yes, that does give you the option not to vote. But one of the most powerful things that we can do as an American is form our our government and the way our country looks and how we want it to feel. And one of the things that you can do that's super impactful is do it at a local level. Just it, voting at the local level is almost more important than presidential. I've had friends that have told me that they will only vote on presidential elections and they didn't vote in November and they didn't vote in March because you can go and look up people's voting records on the Board of Elections. You can see if they voted or not. And I hold my friends accountable to it and they hate me for it and I probably don't get invited back to uh, you know many parties for a month or two, but it's very important. So if we are tired of voting after two votes Continuous votes, back to back. We got to do better than that. That's that's not an excuse for voter fatigue because you know you had to vote more than once every four years. And that's my old man soapbox. I'll get down from it and I'll hand it to somebody else. Gene. No. Okay. All right. The one other thing I wanted to point out to the board too is just timeline. <clears throat> we. In, in terms of the board approving and taking action on a levy going on the November ballot, there is some time. We're not as condensed as we were last time. Uh, that would happen over the course of the summer. However, in terms of personnel decisions that are a result of what we're doing with the levy, we are on a shorter timeline. Uh, because per our negotiated agreements, we have to notify individuals by the end of this month in terms of what our decisions are uh, with those positions, which is only fair to them too, so they have an opportunity to seek other employment. Well, whether we go on the ballot or not, we, we have to reduce staff because we, we won't know. Um, so, I mean. Right. It's the level of reductions. Okay. Though. I'm a, I'm a little confused because, sorry, but if, if we put a levy on in November and we have to notify people, we have no idea whether it's going to pass or not in November now. So we have to assume that we don't get any money in November. So does that not mean we have to make those reductions i guess that's where i'm i'm with genie here because i'm a little confused but that might that might very well it's probably me but no i mean don't we have to make still make the t extra two million because we're not going to get any money y yes we do we do need to make the extra two million uh we presented reductions beyond the two million so we had flexibility in working with the board on what the decisions might be on, on going on the ballot. And we're gonna talk about that in the specifics and more detail in executive session. The one thing I wanna remind the board, if we do not go on in November, we do not collect any money until January of 2026. So you're looking at almost two years right now. And what are our deadlines again for specifically for like the ballot? I know there's certain deadlines for ballot. We have to have everything filed with the Board of Elections by, I believe it's August 7th. So we'd have to, we'd have to pass a resolution to go to the county auditor in June and then pass a second resolution in July to go to the Board of Elections 
so it, we meet the deadline of August the 7th. In, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's putting it okay. you enough time, yes. Well, I'm going to say this. I, the emergency levy, while I don't particularly care for emergency levies, um, it's what I heard from voters who voted no, that they don't trust us with money for the rest of, of forever. And they would like to see just X amount of years. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know whether they'll go along with eight, but that, that's obviously something that you know, we can throw out there. But that is what I heard over and over. They did not want a continuous levy that we could just do whatever we wanted with the money even though we've proved to them over and over we're not wasting that money and i think mr chambers report shows that we are saving money uh, yes people's salaries go up um, many people in this community their salaries went up um, and they want everybody to take a pay cut which is they they just don't quite understand i don't think uh, union contracts and that that would have to be a union decision but I would go along with uh, an emergency levy if, if that's the best way that we can get something passed so we can get new money in 2025. I'm going to jump on Mr. Nichols' soapbox real quick. Um, I just looked and Medina County had 27% voter turnout. So 27%, I will say that was for District 2, made the decision. So I'm going to encourage everyone who's here, which thank you, by the way, for attending this evening, and anyone watching at home and anyone who knows anything, to please go out and encourage your friends and family and neighbors to exercise their voice and their, and their right to vote. And if they have questions about, well, I can't find the financial statements, they can contact anyone here on this board, our treasurer, our superintendent, and we will happily direct them to where the financial statement information is. We will talk to anyone about anything. All of our contact information is posted on the website. So I encourage, we, we are, the, the board is the representatives of our community, but we also, it's, it's a give and take. So we also need community members to be active. Part of being a democracy is not sitting around and waiting for the board to do something for you. We need you to be engaged and we need you to be active. And we don't know what your questions are if we don't know what the questions are. So we can't give you answers unless you call us and ask your questions. So I'm just encouraging everyone to reach out at any time about anything and we will we will have a conversation and I, I encourage those conversations to happen with us but also amongst each other and if you're not sure what the answer is call us and we'll help you out thank you now I also think I also prefer a continuous levy but clearly that 27 percent that voted the majority of them didn't agree with us on that I clearly it is important uh, that these things get get passed. So if it means we have to have an emergency levy to get it passed, then that's what we need. That's what we need to do. And I think we need to do it in November. I don't think we can afford uh, to wait another year before we can start collections. And I think it's also important to point out to the voters we are doing something. We're making four million dollars in cuts. So we're not just asking for money. We are making cuts as well as asking for money that we need. These are not wants. These are needs to continue with our high level quality of education. I think our community expects from our district. And I agree, definitely emergency levy. I'm gonna say the 7.5 again, just to restate to the voters that yes, this is something that we need. Um, Cause if we go down, then they're just gonna come back and say, well, you didn't really need that, but truly we do. Being on the finance committee, I am seeing all the different, uh, you know, educational finance is just blowing my mind. Having been brand new on the board, I am learning a lot of things uh, that I thought I knew, but uh, educational finance is a lot different than business finance and being in business, it is, it's blowing my mind. Um, but I agree, just I don't care about voter fatigue. They need to know that it's real, that it needs to be out there. And yes, my kids, when they first came to Medina, we had, we didn't have the, the levies uh, had passed. My kids were, and myself, 
and the PTOs were the ones that went out and um, did parades around our community just to try and get people's, you know, to hear us. Um, so I am so glad it passed at that time. Um, I agree, the continuous, uh, I believe what uh, Mrs. Pritchard said was the continuous people, I guess the trust factor is not there. So we need to create that trust factor with the emergency, um, get it out there, bring in some money for our schools. So that's my opinion. I'm not against this in any way, shape, or form. Um, I hate to see what losses we may have to do, and that we already are cutting costs. Uh, we have to cut costs, if I'm not mistaken, for this next school year, starting in August, even if we put it out on the levy and if it passes. So that's my opinion. I have um, I've thought a lot since the March election and um, looked at some of the details off the uh, Board of Elections website with the various precincts, including my own. Um, I'm really nervous about voter fatigue. I, I think it's going to be very. I think it's. I think Mr. Sable's right. It's going to be challenging. It's not impossible. It's just going to be very challenging to get anything passed for the schools. But I think we have to do it. Um, I definitely prefer a continuous levy because it's what we need. The costs are not going to go down. The money's not going to suddenly disappear. We're going to need it. Um, and I think where we were at, I think that's a reasonable amount, although in reality, it probably needs to even go up from there to keep maintaining things. But that's kind of where I'm at. But my little my little soapbox for the evening is I just and I hope I hope Mr. Chambers you can we can post this on the website your certificate that we received. I want to point this out to the the public. Um, our treasurer and his department received the highest achievement in open and transparent government from the state auditor of Ohio Keith uh, Faber signed in uh, signed in October of 2023 uh, and this was for open and transparent government of finances so kudos to Mr. Chambers and his department and to the district as a whole for being very open and transparent and if anybody wants to see the financial statements and can't find them by all means get in touch with one of us or um, after a regular board meeting they are posted on board docs for that particular meeting and you can read all 85 pages of the financial statements for the district so that's my soapbox I think if there's no further discussion uh, I'm, I'm hearing from the board <coughs> some sort of an emergency, extended emergency levy in November uh, at the 7.5 mil amount. Uh, and we'll work as an administrative team to reflect that in what the reductions will need to look like across the categories we discussed tonight. Uh, and, and at this time, I think it'd be appropriate to have more detailed conversation in executive session with the board. May I, may I add just one thing? Perhaps it's short, Jeannie, okay? I realize that I did congratulate David at the beginning. I know, but I, want, right? I wanted to read from the certificate. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you hadn't fallen asleep. No, I had not fallen asleep. Okay. I realized that I was reading from the certificate. I pulled it up for that reason. I would maybe suggest that maybe we can have, as you get into your discussions, um, about a levy in November perhaps we can have another work session maybe in May since we have some time where we can just kind of open spitball and do that I think that would be very valid for the public as well so yeah, and I will just jump on a little bit of a soapbox people got on and uh, after the levy lost what can we do what can we do what can we do and we said it's funding 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 
you can't keep sending the same people back to Columbus because it's never going to change. Arizona gives public schools $13,500 for every student that goes to a public school. They give charter schools 7150 Now, Ohio has the money that they could give us $13,500 per student. They don't want to. So write your con the state rep, write our state senator. I just finally got an answer from our state rep um, in my question about funding, but that is going to be the way that things change in funding is you cannot keep sending these same people back. So please, if you want to help us besides voting for our levy, is change what's happening in Columbus. So um, going in, I would uh, entertain a motion to go into executive session to consider the appointment, employment, compensation of a public employee or official in discussion with board's legal counsel of disputes involving the board that are subject of pending and imminent court action. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. West. I'll second. Thank you, Mrs. Parkhurst. Mr. Chambers. Yes, if it please the board. Uh, Mr. West. Yes. Ms. Parkhurst. Aye. Mr. Nichols. Aye. Ms. Smear. Aye. Ms. Pritchard. Aye. Thank there you. will be no action or any voting taken after executive session. Thank you again for coming. We really appreciate it. And next week, we'll be back here at 530. Thank you.